joy to be together on a very special day today. Hello again to churches that are joining in around the district and to our Southside family that's joining us in the room and online. Today we have a very special guest speaker, two of them with us actually, Dr. Christopher Yuan and his mother Angela. And we're excited to hear the word of the Lord today. Dr. Yuan is a highly sought after expert whose book, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, was named the 2020 Book of the Year for Social Issues by Outreach Magazine. Dr. Yuan casts a compelling vision of not identifying with our sexuality, but embracing and living out holy sexuality, which shatters all the categories and secular paradigms of gay and straight or whatever other label may be used. Dr. Yuan will be joined by his mother, Angela, as they minister together, testifying to the transformative power of the gospel. Dr. Yuan graduated from Moody Bible Institute in 2005 and then earned his master's degree in 2007 and a doctorate of ministry in 2014. He went on to teach Bible at Moody Bible Institute for 12 years and his speaking ministry on faith and sexuality has reached across five continents. Angela Yuan has experienced much heartache from a broken but now redeemed marriage and from working through things with her prodigal sons, but God has given her grace upon grace to rely on his power to change things that seemed unchangeable to continue focusing on her own daily renewal and transformation. Christopher's also produced the Holy Sexuality Project. Parents pay attention to that. It's for parents and teens, a first of its kind resource for parents and grandparents to empower teens to understand and embrace and celebrate holy biblical sexuality. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Dr. Christopher Yuan and his mother, Angela. Let's welcome them this morning. America, where money grows on trees and streets are lined with gold. Well, at least that's what I perceived when I first passed through Ellis Island of New York City on October 30th, 1964. But I quickly realized how wrong I was. The first night, I stayed at my friend's rundown apartment in the slum of Harlem. Even more surprising was the day after, October 31st, when little people were in custom, wear masks, and ring doorbells, and said, trick or treat. I said to myself, what have I got myself into? <laughs> Angela, my college sweetheart, came a few months later to America, and we married the next year. I also assumed, just because we were in love, we would simply live happily ever after. How naive I was. <laughs> we were not Christian then, after years of unresolved marriage problem and self-centered living, our marriage was a disaster. So with encouragement from both of our sons, we began the paperwork for a divorce after 28 years of marriage. So on that same year, May 15th, 1993, our son Christopher came home after his first year in dental school, he made the announcement, I am gay. Since our marriage was hopeless, I did not work as a team with my wife to face this enormous challenge. Not only did I not comfort her, but I also accused her of making our son gay. Christopher's declaration affirmed my belief that we should all go our separate ways. Let him be because there's nothing I can do about it. Besides, isn't it more important to be happy? But my wife respond quite differently.
picked up his bags and left. Nothing can describe how I felt at that moment. It was worse than receiving news of Christopher's death. He could have come in with a knife. It would have hurt less. In my mind, Christopher, who was closest to me, and my last ray of hope had also betrayed me. I was at the end of my rope as my world fell apart around me. I had no more reason to live. So I determined to do the unthinkable. I was going to end my life. Even though Chris was, uh, was closest to me and my last ray of hope had also betrayed me. I was at the end of rope as my world fell apart around me. And so I determined to do the unthinkable. I was going to end my life. Even though Chris was, uh, I was not a Christian at that time, I felt the need to meet with the minister who gave me a pamphlet on homosexuality. Then I bought a one-way Amtrak ticket to Louisville where I planned to say goodbye to Christopher for the last time before ending it all. With only my purse and the pamphlet from the minister, I bought on the train thinking that death was the only answer to all my problems. Never be much a reader. On the train, I began to read the pamphlet, which explained the plan of salvation, that all of us are sinners, yet God loves us in spite of our sin. God opened the eyes of my heart. Then I realized that just as God loves me in spite of my sin, I could love Christopher in spite of him living as a gay man. After arriving in Louisville, I called the number from the back of the pamphlet and was connected to a Christian lady who began to disciple me. For six weeks, I immersed myself into the Bible and felt as if I couldn't soak up enough. You see, I went to Louisville expecting to end my life. In reality, I did. One of my favorite verses today is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I got a phone call from the lady who was discipling my wife. The lady was very, very happy. She told me that your wife has surrendered her life to Jesus Christ. She has been saved. I was not very pleased. <laughs> I told her this is not a good news. This is my worst nightmare because from now on, she has God on her side. <laughs> but I realized that her transformation was not an, only a Sunday-only change, but affected every aspect of her life. What she had was not religion, but an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Little did I know, God also worked on me. So I started to go to church with her, and a friend of ours invited us to a Bible study called BSF where we grow deeper into the understanding and love for God and his word. It was well studied the word in my church and in BSF. I also surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. God became the glue, kept our marriage together by drawing both of us to himself. This was God's way for preparing us for the difficult years ahead. As our son walked further and further away from God. For my childhood years, I was like most other Chinese American kids. Obey your parents, do well in school, and of course, practice piano. I didn't fit in with the other American boys. I looked different, I acted different, and I had different interests. God had given me the gifts of music, of sensitivity, and Satan can't take away those God-given gifts, but he can twist the perception of them. And from a young age, I was viewed and ridiculed as being effeminate. The first time I remember having these attractions was when I was nine years old, after I came across pornography at a friend's house. 
at nine. At that young age, I was confused and afraid of those feelings. Without any parental guidance on sexuality, those magazines gave me a distorted view of sex, and they soon became my master. With pornography fueling my desires, I had my first encounter when I was 16 years old, but I kept my feelings hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet and I began living openly as a gay man in the gay community. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs. I went from relationship to relationship, seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found temporarily, but it left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. And to be clear, not all gay men do drugs. This is just my story, not everyone else's story, but drugs do cost money, and I supported my habit by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration of the school expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago, where, where we were living, um, where they were living, to Louisville, where I was going to dental school. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My father was a dentist. He knew the dean very well. All they needed to do was to threaten a lawsuit, and I would stay in school for three months and get my doctorate. Besides, isn't that what any good Chinese parents do anyway? To my surprise, as we sat there in the dean's office, my mother told the dean, it is not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And she said, they're going to support whatever decision the school made. My mom knew that when it comes to her kids, nothing is more important than our children following Jesus. Even more important than education, even more important than career. You know, the sad reality is people may go to church on Sunday and worship God, but often they will return home and worship idols. The idol of education, the idol of career, the idol of their 401k. In essence, we sometimes force our kids to, to do the same. Our parents putting more emphasis upon their children getting the homework done, getting a better grade, getting into a good school, all good things. Or should Christian parents be putting more emphasis, actually the most emphasis, upon our kids following Jesus? Nothing is more important than following Christ. But if I could be honest with, with you, I was not happy about mom's decision. Because she wasn't on my side, I felt. She was on the school side. So I moved further away from them, further away from Chicago, to the bright lights and big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community, and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fake, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator, because in my world, I had become God. Leanne and I had no idea that Christopher was doing drugs, but we knew his biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So I sent him Christian cards several times a week, and I filled them with encouraging words, scripture, and hymns. At the bottom of each card, I sign, love you forever, mom. But little did I know he never read them and simply tossed them into the trash. My wife and I knew the only way if we want to see our son, we have to fly from Chicago to Atlanta, so we did. But on the second day, he kicked us out, not even allowed us to call our friend to pick us up. Before leaving, I offered Christopher my very first Bible. Not surprisingly, he refused, but I left it on his counter anyway and walked out. We found out later he took my Bible, threw it into the trash. It was more than obvious that he was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my wife and I committed not to focus on our own hopelessness, but on the promises of God. 
along with over a hundred prayer warriors from our church from BSF, we cry out to God for our son Christopher. My wife began to pray a very bold prayer. Lord, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for eight years. Once fasted 39 days for our son Christopher. She would literally spend hours inside her prayer closet on her knee, reading the Bible, interceding for Christopher, and praying for herself, for me, and for many, many others. She wrote out some of her prayers, and following is one of those prayers. I will stand in the gap for Christopher. I will stand until the victory is won, until Christopher's heart changes. I will stand in the gap every day, and there I will fervently pray. And Lord, just one favor. Don't let me waver. If things get quite rough, which they may, I would never give up on that son, nor will you. Though the enemy seeks to destroy, I will not quit as I intercede, though it may take years. But I give you my fears and tears as I trust every moment I plead. I prayed those prayers for eight years, and it seemed that God was not answering them. But during those years, God did answer my prayers, just not in the way I expected. His answer for me was, wait, be still, and know that I am God. Looking back upon those years when I prayed for change, God did bring change. The change was not yet in Christopher. But the change was in me and my husband. What God intended for that time was that we will be changed, that we will be transformed, that we will be trophies of God's mercy. Oswald Chambers said, we are not here to prove God answers prayer. We are here to be living monuments of God's grace. As we live out those years of waiting, we learn to walk and live as monuments of his grace as God drew us to himself each and every day. Often answer to prayer doesn't come quickly, and this definitely was not an exception. But my parents were unwavering in their faithfulness to intercede on my behalf. Like the persistent widow, my mother bombarded heaven with her prayers. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the Father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door. On my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. Legal here in Virginia, right? With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I'd started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Land City Detention Center. So I tried calling my friends. You know those type of friends that say, whenever you need something, just give me a call. Those friends that get me more of trouble than anything else. Well, what I didn't know was I had a praying mother at home. Watch out. And she knew that as long as I had those type of friends around, I would find no need for God and no need for my parents. Remember she loves bold prayers? Well, she had prayed specifically years ago that somehow, some way. God would cause all of those friends to desert me. And on that day, not one friend answered my collect call. So you moms out there, beware of your prayers. They're going to come true. 
So I was down to the bottom of the list. Home. And I did not want to make that phone call as I imagined the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But my mother's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, no berating words, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice how Paul doesn't say that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath. But it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you can believe it or not, because I hadn't called home in years. And she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, no matter what heartache she was enduring, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down. Next to the phone was a calculator. She tore off a little piece of the atom machine tape, and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is is in a safe place compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And when I got out of prison, this list of blessings was longer and taller than she is. Both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class, suburb of Chicago. My father had two doctorates. I was just three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can. Something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire Gospel of Mark that night. But let me tell you, I wasn't thinking this is the Word of God, and I certainly wasn't thinking this is the answer. I just thought that I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands, and I better pass it somehow. But as some of you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper. But what we have in our Bibles is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion. And it wasn't a pretty sight. And I thought things couldn't get worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. I was handcuffed. I shuffled into her office. The nurse shut the door behind me. I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words. She couldn't even give me eye contact. So she resigned to writing something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down and I saw three letters and a symbol. It read HIV positive. A few days before Christmas, I received Christopher's phone call from jail. The noise in the background could not cover up his sad and hopeless words. Mom, I am HIV positive. His sullen and weak voice trailed off as my body went limp. I felt dizzy, and the world around me seemed to stop. 
ever since Christopher told us he was gay, I had lived with this constant fear that Christopher might one day contract this deadly virus. My worst nightmare was now a reality. Christopher was sentenced to six years in federal prison, but news of his HIV status was like a death sentence, a verdict I could not accept. Hang up the phone, the pains of grief torn at my broken heart like a knife. Endlessly, I stumble up the steps and drag my heavy body into my prayer closet. Under the cross, I fell to my knees. A stinging tears blur my eyes. This affliction was more than I could bear. In the silence of my sorrow, a melody began to play in my heart. The soft and sweet string of a hymn filled my ears and repeat over and over. It is well, it is well with my soul. When days like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea after receiving that devastating news, I was in my prison cell all by myself just contemplating the mess that I've made of my life. I lie there in my bed and I look up at the cold metal bunk above me. There was graffiti, profanity, gang symbols. But someone had written something else in the corner and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Judah, to tell me that if God could have a plan for Judah in rebellion, in exile, he may even still have a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me, but God gave me enough faith, enough strength to go through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. I wish I could tell you I got down on my knees, I said a sinner's prayer, and then everything after that was perfect, like no more problems. Far from the truth. God began convicting me of my idols, which were many. The most obvious was drugs. But within a few months, he delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols. And there was just this one thing that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, my sexuality. So 
I went to a chaplain and I asked him his opinion. I'm a brand new Christian. I know very little about the Bible. And I thought, I need to ask someone who's studied the Bible, who's gone to cemetery, seminary. The chaplain. And to my surprise, this chaplain actually told me the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And he even gave me a book explaining that view. So think about it. With much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for same-sex relationships. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. Can I just tell you, from a human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and His Word. I couldn't even finish that book and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of Scripture looking for justification. I wanted to find any shred of evidence that might bless a mon a monogamous same-sex relationship. So I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point, a crossroads. Either abandon God in his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? By freeing myself from a sexuality, by not allowing my desires to control who I am and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally. That's true. But as sinners, we often want to add God's truth. And I added, so therefore he doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who might say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. Before I become a Christian, I was under the impression to become a Christian, I had to become a heterosexual. What does that mean? I need to be sexually attracted to the opposite sex. I was even under the false impression that the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if a man had opposite sex attractions, he would still need to flee temptation and resist sin. So heterosexuality, it's the right direction, the right pattern. It's just not the right goal. Because if you think about this, Whereas homosexuality is fully wrong, heterosexuality is actually not fully right. God doesn't command us, be heterosexual, for I am heterosexual. But neither does God say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. They're both secular Freudian categories. Instead, God says, be holy, for I am holy. Thus, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That doesn't go far enough. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or whether I'm tempted, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change is not the absence of temptations. God doesn't promise you come to Jesus and you'll never be tempted again. No, change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit-wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. 
Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal His plan for my life. And He called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized that no matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my call to ministry would remain the same regardless of the location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle. And He shortened my prison sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that if I was going to continue on in ministry after prison, I'd better learn more about the Bible. So I called home, collected my parents. I told them I think God's calling me into ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. They mailed the application into me to prison. I was really excited when I got it, tore it open again, filling it out until I realized I needed references, not from anybody. These had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickings in prison, but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another inmate. So amazingly, I was accepted. I was released from prison July of 2001, started the event next month in August. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> I graduated from Moody 2005, went on to my master's in exegesis 2007, received my doctorate of ministry in 2014, and then back in 2011, I had the wonderful privilege of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. We wrote this together. She wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two. She wrote all the odd, chap odd chapters, I wrote the even chapters. And uh, there's a study guide in the back that's, that many Christian schools are using as a textbook. Who would have thought that our testimony is now a textbook? But it makes sense when we realize all the stories that our kids are being fed and being read starting in pre-K. I don't know what you believe here, but I am convinced that the job to teach sex ed doesn't belong in the hands of public schools. Amen? I don't know if you heard me. Let me say that again. The job to teach sex ed doesn't belong in the hands of public schools. Amen? Who holds that responsibility? parents, but how are you doing? Because in most situations, parents are scared. They think they can't do it until maybe 13 or 14 or maybe 16. When our kids are being bombarded starting at three years old, parents, what makes you think you can wait till even nine or 13? Do you know how much damage control you have to... The world is starting at three. Do not think I'm an alarmist. This is fact. It's starting in Disney. It's starting in Nickelodeon. It's starting all. There is no more kids program that does not have a gay and now trans, even drag queens in their cartoons. I used to say we need to talk to our kids starting from maybe six to eight years old. No more. This is 2024. We need to talk to our kids beginning from three to five. But I'm not talking about we have to tell our kids about sex or sexual intercourse. No. We have to start with the basics that our schools are not teaching. Even our teachers don't even know the answer to this. What is a boy? What is a girl? Our teachers don't know this. Even our doctors don't know this. To be honest, if you have a doctor that needs to ask you if you're male or female, change doctors. Amen? <laughs> change doctors. And teachers who can't answer the question, what is a woman, what is a man, shouldn't be teaching. So we have to begin there. But I know some of you are thinking, and parents, it's not just parents, because you all need help. You know who else God has ordained to, to be discipling our little ones, our children? Grandparents. Are there any grandparents here watching 
I'm adding you to the list because you have too much time on your hands. <laughs> Actually, here's the real reason. Grandma, grandpa, maybe right now you may have more of a listening ear to the grandkids than the parents. Are we using it or are we wasting it? Are we letting the time go by and simply having fun with your grandkids? Have fun. But know for certain today, having fun will not save our kids that are drowning in a tsunami of lies. So where do you start? Well, that's why I wrote my newest book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. Sex, Design, Relationship, Shaped by God's Grand Story. This was named 2020 Book of the Year for Social Issues by Outreach Magazine. And this helps us to have a deeper understanding about sexuality that goes beyond what we normally teach. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. That's important to teach our kids, but we can't stop there because you can't build a Christian life just on God's no. What is God's yes when it comes to sexuality is chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And that is good news for all. But this book I wrote um, that we have here at Southside and, and, and at the, those of you that are streaming in, so glad you're able to stream in. Um, you'll be able to get those um, uh, on Amazon, but also we have them translated in Spanish. So I know that, that the Nazarene churches in the district have a lot of Spanish. We have all these resources in Spanish. Your pastors can take a list because we're the only ones who have those Spanish and send them to us. And we'll love to get these resources because honestly, there are like no resources on biblical sexuality in Spanish. But I wrote my book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, for parents, but we need to do something that's going to stem the tide. Because for the past several decades, our answer is just another pro program. Let's do another program. Let's do something that we can do maybe once a year. Once a year is good, but here's the issue. We do it to youth group, etc. cetera. Where are the parents? Because that gives the impression that teens then can't talk to their parents. Preteens can't talk to their grandparents. We need to end that. So the key is not another program. We need to move the conversation from the classroom or the youth group room to the living room, dining room, and family room. Because the key is home discipleship that will continue on throughout the year, continue on through high school, college, and even the young adult years. So the past three years, my parents and I have been adapting my book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, into a video series called The Holy Sexuality Project. This, was, this is 12 lessons, 36 videos, 270 minutes of content that helps us to engage our kids. This actually was an enormous project. Any of you guys familiar with the Bible Project? So the Bible Project, you know, all that really nice animation. All that anim animation is customized. The illustrations, animation, even the music and sound, all customized. And animation and is very expensive. They charge by the second, 24 frames by second. We have 90 minutes of animation. So this was actually a $1.2 million project by God's grace. Um, there was a, several large Christian organizations that wanted to partner with us, but they wanted to charge $300 per license to purchase it. That's not accessible. So my parents and a few donors actually funded this pro project. So. Our goal is that every Christian household can have one license, a two-year license for themselves. It's only 20. That's not even a trip to Chick-fil-A. And with that $20, it's actually going not at all to pay anyone's salary, not going to pay my salary, no administrative costs. It's actually going forward to the next two projects that we're working on. One for late elementary, fourth through seventh grade, and another one for early elementary, kindergarten to third grade. There is nothing out there for that. So we actually have, um, and you can get this if you're watching online, you can just go to holysexuality.com to get that. But here we have these redemption cards that you could get and get that $20 here. And so exciting, actually a Nazarene pastor, once he heard that we were doing this, he had a a 16-year-old daughter in high school, a junior, a 14-year-old son, freshman, and he went through the whole video series, all 12 lessons in two weeks. We suggest don't do it once a week because that's too spaced out. Maybe, you know, try to do it at least every day or every other day for two to four weeks. And then um, when he began it, 
his son, 14 years old, said, Dad, this is so weird. I'm talking to my parents along with my sister about sex. So awkward. At the end of lesson 12, the dad asked the son, do you still feel awkward talking to your parents about sex? He said, no, Dad. Not at all. If you can talk to your kids or grandkids about sex, you can talk to them about anything. Because silence is no longer an option. Amazingly, God has given us back the years that the locusts have taken away. And my parents and I travel around the nation and around the world talking about God's grace and truth on this issue of sexuality. And then if that wasn't a big enough blessing, God has a sense of humor because he brought me back to Moody where I taught in the Bible to Bob So I went from prisoner to professor. How about that for a resume? But God has done far more abundantly beyond all that we have asked or thought. As the worship team comes up, you know, I know some of you have not heard a story like mine before, a guy who used to identify as gay and now no longer do. And that's an important part of my story, but that's actually not how I best summarize it. This is how I summarize it. I once was blind, and now I see. I once was lost. And now I'm found. I once did not believe. And now I believe in the Son of God. And his name is Jesus. That's my testimony. Now I know you here at Southside and some of you watching virtually may have noticed this empty stool here. Over a year ago, actually just coming up in a few days, July 3rd, it will be two years, that my dear dad went home to be with the Lord. He was very, very sudden. He was extremely active. He was 82, and he would travel with me and... and, um, he would travel 40 to 50 times a year. I have a policy. I don't travel alone. I'm single. And so I, my mother travels everywhere with me. She travels 60 to 70 times a year with me. She's 82. She's doing pretty good. My dad, when he was 82, he would travel with me for, with us 40 to 50 times a year. And you saw him. He preached the gospel, doing it more than men half his age. I ever get to be 52. I want to be like dad. My mom and dad were running errands and my dad fell in the parking lot and he hit his head really hard on the pavement. They rushed him to the ER and by the time I got there, he was in and out of a, of a coma. The doctor pulled me aside and said that they couldn't stop the internal bleeding and he said there wasn't much hope. I told the doctor, with all respect, I always have hope. Any of you know of that hope? And so we got hundreds of people praying for dad, praying for a miracle. And 48 hours later, God answered that prayer. When he brought my dad home. My mom and I were before the shell of his body at his bed and we're about to leave. His heart was failing, his brain function was gone and as we were leaving, my mother took my hand. She told me something I'll never forget. She said, we are gonna tell everyone that Dr. Leon Yuan is not dead. He is now more alive than he ever was before. My dad came to faith later in life, but once he did, he wanted everyone to know Jesus. Do you know going to church doesn't save you? You know that? It's good, but it doesn't save you. Having a godly spouse, parent, that 
draws you out of bed and brings you to church, it's good, but it doesn't save you. Reading the Bible every day, good, still doesn't save you. But believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confessing with your mouth that he rose from the dead and you will have eternal life. So here's the question for us here at Southside, here in the Virginia district. Whether you're watching online or here in person, this is the most important question that we need to answer this morning and for the rest of your life. Is Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and our all in all? Because if not, Today's the day. Today's the day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you that there's nothing that we could have ever have done that could have merited your good favor, that could have deserved you sending your son who lived a perfect life, who went to the cross willingly and then died for us, died for me, so that my sins would be forgiven and then, hallelujah, he rose again. By grace, through faith in Christ, will we who believe rise with him. Oh God, I pray for those today, whether teenagers, whether kids, whether elderly, Lord, if they have come to faith to you across this district, Lord, I pray that they would talk to a pastor, talk to a, an elder, talk to a deacon, talk to someone to have them walk, begin this journey. But Lord, I pray, Father, for the rest of us here this morning, watching, Lord, that you would encourage. I pray for the grandparents, Lord. It is a crazy world here in Virginia, here in the United States, here in the world. Lord, we need help. And you are that help. Lord, I pray for boldness among parents and grandparents to no longer shrink back, no longer to think that they can wait until kids are 12 or 13 to begin the conversation, but we need to begin now. I pray for those struggling. I pray for parents with prodigals, Lord, that they would not give up on hope that you do the impossible. But most of all, oh God, help us to love you more than life. For it's in the matchless, precious, beautiful name of Jesus we pray. And the people of God said, amen.